It's the Fulhamish Podcast, your independent voice of Fulham FC. My name's Sammy James. Welcome to the show. Today, it is the Thursday Club. Looking ahead to our trip to Tottenham on Sunday. Always nice to head to the north of the capital, go to that fancy new ground, and fingers crossed, maybe we can get a point or three. Joining me on the Thursday Club today is Jack Collins. Hello. Hello, Sammy. I'm going to remind you of you saying always nice to head to north of the capital when you're on that hour and a half walk back to Seven Sisters and you're standing in that queue for hours and hours on end because none of the pubs take away fans at that point. I'll just let you, I'll, I'll remind you of that. Well, I won't need to because I'll be so busy celebrating for uh, <laughs> hours after the game that all the crowds will disperse by then. Also on the Thursday club today, Dan Crawford, hello. Hello, Sammy. Yeah, I'm very surprised that you think it's such a lovely place to go. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> well, the ju- no. your judgment's always been iffy in my book. <laughs> I just mean the stadium itself. The toilet bowl of despair. You can't you can't lie and tell me that it's not a nice stadium. <laughs> no, it's stadium. lovely. It's lovely. Also, like, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited because I'm going fancy at the weekend. My dad's got some hospitality tickets. Whoa. And he was like, there's Corp's, some... Corby Hoss. Well, this is it. He, he helped someone, one of the architects, when he was working a couple of years back, and they've offered him two sets of hospitality tickets this year. So it was one for me and one for my brother. And they're going to Brighton and Tottenham. And before my brother had even read the message, I was like, I'll have the Spurs one. Thank you. And I'm very excited. So I get to see the fancy bits. So I'm excited about that. He's changed, hasn't he, Dan? Well, he's very excited. It's very strange. People from Acton don't go to hospitality. Well, that's why I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> it might be a one and only time in a exactly. VIP area. I'll be, I'll be thrown out within 20 minutes. Yeah, sounds so, about like, right. I'm excited to uh, to spend that 20 minutes in the, in the hospitality bit. <laughs> nice. I've never done this before. I've never been in a hospitality <laughs> You surprise me, Collins. No, I know. Like, honestly, it's one of those. I've never been in one and I'm really excited because i don't really know what you do i've got one can i cheer like what that was no. the crack no of course you can't cheer you're in the home end yeah but like, surely i'm in like a little box no you know, well unless well, you like, might end up in a box yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i've literally never done this before i legitimately don't know I've what the crack is only one tale of uh corpy hoss watching fulham away um, Corpy I'm, Hoss. Oh my goodness. Corpy the Hoss street cred of this podcast is <laughs> disappearing rapidly. I don't think it had much to begin with. Um, <laughs> I went to Arsenal 3, Fulham 3. Uh, a very uh, fun game. Uh, I think it was in the Yol It times. was, yeah, it was, yeah. And we went 2 0 down. We then went to 3 2, and then Arsenal equalised. And so while this all, uh, Brian Ruiz had a masterclass. Um, Mark Schwartz will hurt you if you don't mention the last wow. minute penalty. This is, this is what's oh, coming, coming up. Right, okay. So all three of those goals, I, I stayed silent. Dimitar Berbatov also had a bit of a masterclass that day. And me and my dad had, you know, managed to stay quiet. We were quite close to the Fulham fans, but we were definitely in the Arsenal section. And then, yeah, uh, Arsenal get a stoppage time penalty and it's absolute injustice. Not only because Fulham had played so well, but the penalty was soft. Really, really soft. Mark Schwartz saves it and both me and my dad just couldn't... And we were so desperately upset. We were like, no, how has this gone from us? Fulham should be winning this. And we just couldn't help ourselves but cheer and made the most rapid exit from the corporate hospital. None of the post-match stuff was available to us (laughs) because we had to leave. Mm. Um, so yeah that's my one experience right so. well let's hope for something similar I have to be carted out by Tottenham <laughs> Security as we score a last minute winner um, that make me very happy also on the buttons today is Elizabeth hello hi Tommy hi Jack hi Dan I feel hi. like the last hello. couple of podcasts Liz has been here and suddenly just sprung up out of nowhere so I thought I should give you the introduction today Thank you, Sammy. Yeah, it's nice to pop on and all the stuff I want to chat about and I can avoid all the rest of the stuff. So yeah, perfect situation, really. <laughs> Voice of God producer. You've moved chairs, Lizzie. Last week, just you and I here chatting away, having a lovely time. So. I had a fabulous time. Exactly. Even if we called the Wolves game. Very wrong. Yes, interesting. Uh, you were very confident going into that uh, that Wolves game. Um, and to be honest... Given that lineup, Jack, from Wolves, one fit centre back. Mm. I do think that I don't think it was big headed or arrogant for most Fulham fans to think that that should have been three points on Saturday. Whilst I think there are extenuating circumstances, it's a massive missed opportunity. Yeah, I mean, look, credit to Wolves, they were excellent, right? So that, that has to be kind of put first and foremost at the top of it. They battled for every ball. And after Fulham were dominant for 25, 30 minutes, they were able to score a brilliant goal as an equaliser, but it came as a bit of a bolt from the blue and then actually ramped the gears up through that. And actually Gary O'Neill, who's come under a fair bit of slack uh, stick and, and rightly so, I think across the course of this season, 
made some really interesting tweaks with how the game was playing out in order that Wolves were able to take the ascendancy out of it. And that's something that we haven't really seen from him this season. It's something that we have come not to expect from Wolves, actually even from the back half of last season. Obviously, they had a great start to last year and then fell off. And then the start of this season has been very difficult. This is a talented Wolves squad. But as you say, it was a depleted Wolves squad at the same time. And Fulham weren't able to prod and probe our way through that back line aside from that first 25 minutes, in a way that any of us would have expected from the last couple of performances. And to be honest, the second half from where I was sitting, we looked jaded. Wolves were good, credit, right? Like, that, that's fine. And they didn't let us play our game and that needs to be kind of addressed in itself. But actually, the way that Fulham went about their business, considering it was on the back of two very, very important and impressive wins in different sort of circumstances, and considering the game had started so well with Fulham knocking the ball about almost at will, that fall off in the second half and that inability to kind of ramp back up to match Wolves' intensity, to match their game plan, to match the balance that they had in midfield, which I thought was excellent, and to kind of stand off an attacking threat that we know is very, very strong felt really weird from where we were sitting. It never felt like Fulham were going to get our, fight our way back into that game. Uh, Dan, your take on the uh, on the Wolves game? Well, it was really disappointing, but I mean, it rather sums up what the Premier League is, is all about, doesn't it? Um, it won't surprise Jack to know I see it slightly differently in terms of Gary O'Neill, um, who, who I think is a good manager yeah. and certainly uh, struggled with those for that, that first run of fixtures. Um, but there, there's some structural things I think that Marco Silva is going to have to address with the side. I, I'm coming to the end of my my tether with um, Smith Rowe and Pereira in the same midfield. Yeah. It feels like the two, and I know you guys have talked about this previously. It feels like the two of them are performing each other's job or getting in the way of one another. Um, and obviously, I mean, I thought the best player on the pitch for Fulham was Sasha Lukic, yeah. by a long way. But the reason he was the best player on the pitch was because he had to do everything. <laughs> you know, there was no, <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was nothing else. And, you know, I'm a big admirer of Andreas Pereira and what he brings to the team. Um, but he will admit to you he's had a poor season. And Emil is someone who's still feeling his way back. He's still trying to work the balance of that midfield out. And it felt like we were too easy to play through yeah. time and time again. And the most concerning thing for me was, apart from Harry Wilson's little chip after he came off the bench, there was literally very little that Fulham offered having gone 2-1 down. Yeah. And, you know, we've all sat here and castigated Marco for being a bit... Um, being a bit standoffish with his substitutes, yep. cautious with his substitutes. <laughs> Took it to the other extreme. And yeah, you know, I'm almost like, come on, Marco, you can sort of do it, do it gradually. Incrementally. There's, there's yeah. no, you know, we don't have to go all or nothing every time. But I still think we have to look at where we are uh, at this point. We're certainly higher in the in the table than I thought we would be. We're playing better football than I thought we would be. And we're defensively, for the most part, more solid without Xiao Polina, which for me is remarkable. Yeah. You know, I, I really feared for us when we didn't replace um, Pellegrini. But I think to Jack's point in respect of um, how we started that game, it does kind of underline that we need to be clinical in the, in, in the final third. And we probably need to be looking at a new addition up front in, in January. I mean... Jack, I do wonder if Berger was ill, obviously, for this. Yeah. So you'd imagine he will be back for Sunday. I wonder if actually Sunday, and we'll come on to exactly how Fulham line up, but I wonder if Sunday might be the moment where we go Smithrow, Lukic, Berger. I wouldn't be at all surprised if we play out a Sunday and with the same starting eleven that we played out against Manchester City. Mm -hmm. What, so maybe... Um, drop Smith Rowe. Mm. I wouldn't be surprised. Not necessarily because, obviously, Emma Smith Rowe's a bit of a funny case in this one because he's obviously an Arsenal boy. His dad's a Tottenham fan, famously, and so he's he's always had that kind of bizarre relationship between the two clubs. Um, so there's maybe something to be thought about in, in that regard, that this is a game that matters. He's scored at Spurs' stadium before, and therefore, and he's had good performances there. For Arsenal, there was one where he was pretty much the main man and that was one of the games that really kind of shot him into the public consciousness. So 
you know, I, you obviously can't pick a game a couple of years ago and say, well, that's why he should start. But I do wonder if this is, especially with the way that Spurs played against Manchester City last weekend, you look at that and you kind of flip the narrative and be like, okay, well, how good, where were they excellent? Well, they were excellent through the middle, right? That Then sort of the deep runs from, from Madison, who came back into the team, was excellent. Kulisevsky drifting off the wing. We're going to have problems if we are lightweight in the middle against Spurs, I think. And right now, I think what we can learn from that game against Wolves is that we did look lightweight in the middle. It wasn't Andreas's best game. Absolutely not. Um, and I don't think it was Smith Rowe's best game either. So you can kind of look at both of them and think, well, who's brought more to the table there? The answer is probably neither. Um, and, and maybe there's something in, in that as well. But there is a sense, and I think Dan's absolutely spot on with this, that that midfield is not fine, has not found its balance yet. Now, I would quite like to see a little bit more of Luke Kitchenberger and Elizabeth and I spoke about this a little bit last week when you know we were talking about Sasha coming back into the team with how that balances out and if the fact that Sasha Lukic does a lot of the defensive work as well as being able to, to pass the ball forwards and progress the ball well because he's up there in the top players in the Premier League for, for progressive passes this season. There's also a sense that that might free Sa- Sander Berger to go on a little bit more of the destructive runs that we've not really seen from that we have seen in different places, Sheffield United at Burnley, he has that ability to sort of maraud through midfield at times, even if that's not necessarily, you know, the the role you expect from him. I am intrigued to see if that balance can be found between the two of them and if we can look to build on that going forward. Yeah. I mean, Dan, there was an element as well of a bit of bad luck at the weekend. I've never really seen that. I certainly not in my kind of like memory of Fulham having to self-inflicted go down to 10 men. And it was mentioned a lot on Sunday's podcast that at least Marco went for it at that point. He didn't just sit, oh, okay, well, let's just see out 2-1. Not much we can do with 10 men. He actively went for the equaliser, even though we never really looked that close to getting one. I don't mind really losing 3-1, 4-1 if it was actually the risk of potentially trying to go for it in those in those final few minutes no it comes down to the basic the, the difference between silver and the money replaced we all love watching the style of football and the adventure that that marco brings to it he's a winner hmm. he sets high standards for his teams and he will play adventurous football the, the part that i struggle with at the moment is in so many areas we don't quite know what the best option is you know I thought, um, oh, I think Sunday coming up, for instance, is made for someone like Adama Traore to get out of Tottenham. Um, what was interesting was Wolves played Ryan out out Nori really high, uh, sorry, and Samedo really high to stop Robinson getting forward. Robinson got forward right at the beginning, and then that was virtually it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think we've got a lot of wingers. And a lot of number 10s, some number 10s playing in central midfield. And it feels like, you know, I think Raul Jimenez will still be having nightmares about about the one he missed. Um, but it's my thing that, rather like the Brentford game, which was brilliant um, in the way it ended, but it took Wilson's introduction to put players in the penalty area, yeah. numbers in the penalty area. And he took, the, took it upon himself to get in the penalty area and support the centre forward. And I think um, that's what Marco wants. But obviously, losing Anderson like that is something that you can't can't legislate for. And the, the goals we conceded were suboptimal, shall we say? Mm-hmm. You know, the Bassi and Anderson, and even Leno leaving the first one to each other. It's a great finish, good bit of control. It's but... a lovely dink, to be fair. No, it is. No, it is. But Mario Lamina has seen that pass. That pass was on, yeah, yeah, yeah. and someone's got to react to it. The second goal, we lose the ball on the edge of our own box, dilly dallying around. I mean, that's the word of the guy behind me, who's very much like full Brexit when it comes to not playing out from the back. Thumped just, it. just get rid of it. <laughs> is the way he, he, he looks at it. So I had to endure that. Um, <laughs> and the third goal, the third goal was a beauty. But what and and the fourth goal? God, I'm not sure we even had any players able to run back at that point. No, but it was about five on one. And I think so that's your point, Sammy. Is I mean, I did a, I did see a lot of that in the late eighties and early nineties when you know most of our players were cream crackered after about seventy minutes, and the denouement never really went well. Um, but it is a consequence of Silver throwing caution to the wind and going for it. And like you, 
I'd much rather he do that than like protect the goal difference or some nebulous. Thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ultimately, Jack. I think as a summary for for Wolves, and we'll move on to Spurs next. I see it as cause for concern. Definitely some things that we can learn from this Wolves game. But I still stand by my initial post match thought, which is let's not read too much into this. I don't think like this suddenly means that Fulham are going to be struggling to stay up or going on a gigantic losing run. I mean, we've got a tough run of fixtures, yeah. of course, but I still believe that it was a bit of a weird game that, in all honesty, could have actually kind of gone either way had a few things fallen differently. Yeah, I, like, I think my genuine, genuine takeaway was if the game ends 11 versus 11, it probably ends 2-1 Wolves and that would have been a fair result. right? I think we didn't deserve to win that game on the balance of play after that first 25-30 minutes. Like they made the better chances. There were some, you know, big opportunities that were missed as well from Wolves. Uh, that you know, a couple that went wide, and you know, I had my brother at the same time shouting, "There it goes! Here it is!" And they would it would drift wide, and you'd be like, "Oh, okay, right, fine. It's not over just yet." Mm-hmm. I think two one would have been a fair result. I don't think we deserved anything out of the game. I take your point that those things can often swing, but I think the Anderson, you know, going off injured, and obviously we hope he's he's all right. <laughs> but I hope it's nothing more serious. And nothing's been reported as yet. That it is more serious than just just a knock, and yet he just wasn't able to continue. It does feel like one of those games that we didn't deserve to win. There are lessons to be learned. We should move forward. It's not going to be a result, I don't think, that defines our season equally. The flip side of that is if you do want to go and challenge for Europe and do all of those things, then you need to win games against teams below you in the table at home. Like It's as simple as that. And ultimately we have failed to do that and that is probably the reason that Fulham will be fine I'm not saying I'm with you and I don't think we need to panic and think Fulham are going to be dragged in to a relegation scrap but I'd also think that that's the difference between the teams above us and the teams that are going to challenge your Brightons etc even Bournemouth I think to an extent you're kind of looking at and thinking they'd probably win that game they'd probably find a way to do it and Fulham just there's that level of inconsistency that just doesn't quite feel right at the moment in order to try and push on and kick on. Now, maybe that gets fixed. As Dan said, you know, a, a striker in, in January. I mean, I I would probably posit that Rodrigo Muniz's cameo in this game might have been the worst 15 minutes of football I've ever seen from anyone. Like, the ball just sort of bounced off his knees. Uh, it bounced off his legs. Rodrigo Muniz play before. So. No, I know, but like, well, I thought we kind of threw the baby giraffe stage, but now I feel like we're right back at baby giraffe stage. Like, it, it really did feel like he'd maybe found a way to utilise his frame. And like, obviously he's not, you know... But what's he supposed to do in that situation? No, I know, the but The ball like, wasn't like... The people around me were slagging off him and his, which I thought was bizarre. No, but no, no, I'm not saying it was wrong. No, what, him on. no, no, but what I'm saying to you is... It's, the, the, the problem, Mernes looks a much better striker when he's got the ball, right? And we didn't get the ball into places where he could hurt the opposition. And sure, his control was lacklustre and he ran up some blind alleys, but so did every other Fulham player yeah. consistently. I just like it's like you know there's one thing giving him the ball there's another thing every time the ball coming to him it going ricocheting off into Rose Edge like it, it really did feel like there was no ability to trap or, or try and bring himself into play because he hadn't got the ability to bring the ball down I, I agree no there one was great there be a common theme though with Silver and both Jimenez and Moon is but maybe just also Silver strikers in general that the, the kind of like throwing them on with 15 minutes to go when we're chasing a game i still am waiting for the day that it works yeah i mean it's, it's me never too. worked it hasn't worked jimenez always looks rubbish coming off the bench as well and looks quite good starting and same with with moon is it's just one of those but all, was... of the, but all of this comes back to the fact that as we've spoken about before fulham didn't actively replace the number nine who we all um we all know. And then even this season, you let uh, Joe Stansfield go to Birmingham. And I understand the reasons why the club has done that. But I'll tell you, Joe Stansfield coming off the bench with 15 or 20 minutes to go in that kind of scenario will present a different problem to Premier League defences. And I would posit, to borrow one of your phrases, <laughs> that that might, that, might be, that might have been an avenue for, for, for potential points or at least a problem for, for other sides. We are very formulaic, as you say, mm-hmm. in the way that we chase the game. It's either Wilson, Kearney, or Munez, all around the 65-minute mark. Uh, 
and or Darby Trier and hope for the best. Well, and, and there's the thing. Like, I'm not sure quite where anybody stands on the Reese Nelson Adama Traore thing. I'm not wild about the fact that Nelson's people are putting it out there that he's not been happy before. Yeah. Last weekend, that he wasn't starting enough games. You know, I think he's a very good footballer, but also I think it's pretty harsh on Adama Traore what he's done this season to suddenly go back and. And be a be a be a substitute. To be fair, Adama also could was up there in terms of credit. And he he did really manage to to basically forget that he was wearing white and not gold. I think uh, the weekend it really was one of those bizarre performances where it looked he a came little on. Bit, there was a moment like, he didn't run for like it was like three. Like I was like the only thing you're really really good at is running, right? And the ball goes <laughs> over the top, and he just stayed there. And I was like, what are you doing? Like that didn't make any sense whatsoever from my perspective. I mean, look. The kind of main point I was making there was was that, and, and I agree with Dan, that and someone needs to come in in January. Now, whether that's a different type of striker or it's someone who's better at doing the things that Marco Silva clearly wants from his strikers, there is a certain type of striker that seems to be Silva's type. The recent reports in recent days, and of course I was going to bring this up. I was waiting for this. Here we go. Here we go. Evan Ferguson on loan. Yeah. Ireland. Yeah, I well, no, no, honestly. love to so. see it. <laughs> Teddy Khan went down south, etc., etc. Yeah, I haven't worked the rest of it out. <laughs> I haven't worked out the rest of it yet. Someone find something that works for offenders. Teddy like, Khan went to Cork. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bohemians. <laughs> yeah. So, but like that is, you know, that if that is a market opportunity, and the two sides currently in the reckoning for Evan Ferguson services are us and Leicester, we should be winning that hands down, right? Considering where those two teams are right now, considering the opportunities available, and if Evan Ferguson comes in alone. He starts right, like oh, it's as simple really? as that. Really? Well, I, but this is it. Where, whereas I think with Breuer last year, there was a kind of question mark over whether he's actually had the pedigree to go and do it in the Premier League, um, and whether there was that opportunity. Where I don't think that's the case with Evan Ferguson. I think if he comes in, there is, you know, an immediate spot for him to fill, given where Fulham are right now. Well, I think he's How? got 17 goals in 73 games. Jimenez beats him hands down on Premier League goals. Goal yeah, but, but also, I, do, if you I think that there might be a bit of, you know... If you give that chance green, green to eyed, Evan Not the green-eyed monster, but green-eyed envy or green-eyed <laughs> bias. If you're going to sit here and tell me that Raul Jimenez starts in front of Evan Ferguson at this age, at their respective yeah, ages... Th- yeah. Then I I I don't know what to say to you. I'm trying to work out how many minutes it will take you after the transfer is confirmed for you to go to the club shop and buy an Evan Ferguson shirt. Yeah, they've done it already. I might have one already. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just working out one. But just the just way. on this, there is another point. I'd like to see Smith Rowe further forward. What in right? the ten? In nine? No, no, no. In like he he should be playing in the ten. Yeah. A lot of the time, I, I call it the Ross McCormack problem. In that our most creative players end up somewhere in the Bermuda Triangle, Fine, yeah. rather than rather than influencing the game where the opposition yes. least want them to be. And I think if he was freed up to do that with a burger slash Luke combo in yeah. the in the middle, you might see a bit more. And I, you know, it could be Pereira instead, but that would give you more of an attacking um, output. But anyway, we said this was going to be the last word on Wolves, and we've done about fifteen minutes yeah, more. Yeah, no, that's how fine. podcasts go. Um, or Wilson in there, to be honest. Yes, like, good I, like I really don't mind. I, I'm with you though. I would like to see at Spurs a Berger, Lukic midfield with one of the three of them in front, and I honestly don't mind who. All right. Well, we'll take a break there. Afterwards, we will look a bit more in detail at that match on Sunday. This episode of Fulhamish is brought to you by NordVPN, which is the tool I use to watch all the festive football by changing the location of either my tablet, my laptop or my phone. It is particularly perfect for those 3 p.m. kickoffs, which aren't available here in the UK. All you need to do is go to NordVPN, change the location of your laptop or whatever device you're using, and then you can access platforms which are not only much cheaper than those here in the UK, they also show all the games, unlike what we have, where we only get a fraction of them. It means that I can watch every single Fulham game, whether it's on the telly or not. I also use NordVPN in order to access cheaper flights and hotels, as quite often, switch your location, you'll find those become a bit less expensive as well. You can use NordVPN on up to 10 devices, so I share my login with friends, family, and colleagues. And right now, you can get a great deal by going to nordvpn.com slash Fulhamish. Not only will you get to access a great rate, but you get 4x 
extra months as well. And it's completely risk-free thanks to Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. So to get that great rate plus four extra months, go to nordvpn.com slash Fulhamish. That's nordvpn.com slash Fulhamish. Part two of the Fulhamish podcast is Sammy here with Jack, Dan and Liz on the buttons. Let's look ahead then to Spurs on Sunday at 1.30 kickoff, I believe it is, at the uh, Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Uh, stop me now if I've got that wrong. Don't get too many 1.30s, a little bit odd. Um, we're playing on Sunday because Spurs are in the Europa League on Thursday uh, against Roma at home, which is obviously quite a big game for them, the we Jack. survived Jose Mourinho derby. <laughs> yes, uh, I guess you can add uh, Man United and probably soon Fenerbahce uh, to, to that list. Um, it is actually a game that Tottenham, I wouldn't say they need to win, but after losing to Galatasaray last time out, I don't think they can afford here to put out too much of a weakened 11. Roma not doing that well so maybe they can afford to rest a couple of players yeah i mean roma now managed by uh, claudio ranieri so another ghost from fulham's past knocking yeah. about uh, in north london a couple of days <laughs> beforehand um yeah i mean it, it does feel like a big i think it's a game that they need to win if they don't want to play those extra two games in january right yeah. like that that's where it's at like if you if you're spurs and you're like we want to avoid that playoff round and we want to finish in the top eight of this competition then you need to beat roma at home and if you don't, then you're going to probably drop into those playoffs. And that's fine. But it's a separate kind of point in terms of uh, of where we are. So, but I do think he'll rotate. I do expect to see Will Lancashire start. I do expect to see Mikey Moore getting minutes here in this one for Spurs. I would imagine that given the exertion that they had in that City game, which was an interesting game in terms of how it played out, City the better side for the first 10, 15 minutes, looked very comfortable in possession. And then Spurs started to find that directness, that kind of ability to hit on the break. And actually, this is quite an interesting thing with Spurs. And I wonder how Fulham play it on, on Sunday because they have looked incredibly dangerous in transition when they've been given those abilities. And what was really impressive about Spurs at the weekend was that they were so direct and they were, it was, you know, kind of look at the passes between the two sides in the game and City trying to thread their way through Spurs obviously didn't work. Spurs' pass count is so far down on what they normally are. Their possession count is so far down on what they normally are and they produce their best performance of the season. That's the blueprint that they will look to kind of push going forward. Now, that doesn't mean they can't play other ways. We've seen Spurs dominate sides with the ball. But I do think their most dangerous asset is when they are pinned back and they can find ways to spring what is an exceptionally talented front three into action and allow the midfield, especially Madison, to kind of drive from deep. It's been Kulisevsky in other games, but let's put it like that for now. And I wonder if Fulham play slightly differently at the weekend. I I wonder if Fulham look to actually lay off possession a little bit, not quite in the same way that we did against City, but on that kind of game plan in order to try and spring Spurs at their own game. Because it does feel that with a couple of key players still out, I think Christian Romero has been ruled out originally of of this trip to Roma, but not trip to Roma, the game against Roma. Um, And then we're not sure about the weekend. Van der Ven's still out for a little while. Dragosan and Davis were excellent uh, at the weekend together, but can you get in behind them? That's the sort of big question mark of where they are. And with Vicario out, it looks like Fraser Forster is going to be in goal. And... Fraser Forster has not been very good over the course of this season. I'm sure he'll drop a masterclass at the weekend. Yeah, um, but, but I think that there are opportunities there for Fulham to take advantage of if we can. And I wonder how Silva looks at this and how he plays it. And if there is something of our game against City that we can use as a blueprint to try and recreate against this Spurs side. Yeah, I mean, Dan, against the, uh, the trademark Ange Postacoglu high line, surely surely Adama Traore is going to be back on the pitch. You'd have thought that this game on a big old Tottenham pitch against the Spurs defence that likes to camp on the edge of uh, the opposition penalty box um, surely should be utilised here. Yeah, I mean, we mentioned it earlier. Silva does some things that surprise surprise us from time to time. But... um, I think Jack's laid it out really well now. Can we get behind Tottenham? Yes, I think even Raul Jimenez could get behind those those centre-backs and flourish. But I do think we have to demonstrate... The, the thing about... Um, I've always thought this Fulham team is well-suited to playing away from home. 
Yeah. Right? The way that we look much more solid this season defensively. Um, mm. Obviously, we'll have to wait and see whether Joachim Anderson's calf injury is serious enough to prevent him from, from training. Um, there's some doubt about that at the moment in terms of whether he's going to be fit to play. But I don't, you know, people will laugh at this. But I, I, I do think uh, Issa Diop has got a bit of a rough ride um, so far this season. Mm. Um, I, I think he's a very serviceable um, player and his physicality is useful in some of these um, situations. But I think almost you do have to go a bit more bit more direct yeah. you do have to recognize that the opposition has strength in in, in the center of midfield but i don't have a problem with um berger and lukic dealing with uh dealing with madison because you know a norwegian has done that very successfully before <laughs> um with, with, with james madison and i would just say if we're talking about Sander Berger, you watch his last two performances for Norway. Yeah. Absolutely outstanding in Norway, um, getting promoted in, in the Nations League. That looks every inch the kind of £20 million player who, who we, were, we were looking for. And I do think there wouldn't have been quite as much space for Wolves to, to operate. But that we've got, we will certainly be adventurous on, on, on Sunday. Um, and it's one of those ones where you wonder whether Marco should just sit in a little bit more rather than go for it. But I think Tottenham are weak defensively. In fact, we don't even need to debate that. They are. They concede terrible goals um, all throughout all throughout this season. Um, and it's about time we, we we did something at Tottenham. Um, you know, is it Dimitar Berbatov? All those. All those years ago, yeah, and maybe before that, Barry Hales in two thousand and three. The masterclass. I mean, that 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 actually that Chris Coleman performance is the blueprint. I mean, it, it is twenty one years ago, so I imagine. <laughs> and I imagine. I time. imagine people. <laughs> People listening to this podcast have no idea what I'm talking about. But Coleman went in the very early stages of the season with a 4-5-1 that became a 4-3-3 with Bar Morte on the left, Malbranco on the right and Sahar through the middle. And we absolutely... We, we ended Glenn Hoddle's glorious second reign at, 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 White, at White Hart Lane. And I think the same vulnerabilities are present in Postacoglu's side. And, I'm, you know, it means a lot to me. A lot of my family are... Um, Spurs, unfortunately. So um, I'm hoping that we can put in a performance this Sunday. I mean, Jack, um, it does feel like a little bit of a battle of um, Spursy versus Fulhamish oh, yeah. um, this weekend. Uh, Drew wrote a, a lovely uh, column in on the BBC Sports uh, website where he kind of used the two terms uh, with a little bit of uh, tongue in his cheek. Um, but obviously, like Spurs' Premier League form since... Um, September is win loss win loss win loss, um, and even actually, if you look at even like Europe and stuff, it's kind of on a similar pattern. They've obviously won this game on Saturday four 0 their most impressive win of the season by an absolute country mile. Yeah, but I remember back in March when we faced Tottenham at the Cottage, they had just gone to Aston Villa and won four 0 and this was an Aston Villa who seemed kind of impenetrable particularly at Villa Park at that time and it was definitely their most impressive result of the season obviously the next game was the 3-0 at the cottage I don't know why I just and this is based on not much more than just vibes (laughs) okay kids I've just got a weird feeling that Fulham might turn up in this game. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that obviously when you have a bad performance, you need to bounce back. Now, Spurs will be riding a high, but they'll also have had a midweek game. Um, as I say, it, it remains to be seen how rotated that side is and what we see from them as a whole. But I, I do think it's interesting to kind of examine Spurs and examine what they've been like. And I, and I honestly do think, and I was saying this, watching the game in the pub afterwards, we want Spurs to beat City. We want Spurs to be. Yeah, I can verify that because there is this element of, you know, that I agree, Spursiness that that exists within this, and it would be very Spurs to go and beat City and then lose at home to Fulham. And a lot of people have said it this week, right? Not just not just Fulham fans, but Spurs fans all over the shop, right? And we have a lot of them on on ranks in our Patreon community, and they were all like, "Put your money on Fulham winning next weekend," right? Like they were all doing these things, and it'd be very Fulhamish to lose at home to Wolves and then go and beat Tottenham, right? This, this is the the two terms in their kind of extremities. 
I think you have to try and analyse it in, in, in a way that's a little bit deeper than that. And they are in a good run, but equally they were frustrated in that game at home to Ipswich where Ipswich sat deep and, and, and kind of blocked them out and stung them twice uh, in, in quick succession. There are defensive frailties to this side and I don't think it's being disrespectful to Spurs to say that. I think that you can look at that side and say, you know, there are issues in terms of how that defence is covered by the midfield. It's got better over the course of the season once Postacoglu stopped. And actually, it's quite a nice comparison in some ways, playing twin eights in front of a single number six and actually started playing with a double pivot and someone playing in front of them. That has solidified Spurs a little bit. And I wonder if there's something to learn from Marco Silva from, from that kind of adjustment that, that's been made in that regard. I think it's one of those games where, like, at, n at no point am I coming into this saying Fulham are favourites. And, and I think it would be wild too. But I would not be su surprised, shocked, whatever, to come out of that stadium with three points. Yeah. And the weird thing about last season's game at Tottenham, Dan, was actually Fulham had opportunities to take the lead that day. And it was ju it was mostly um, Calvin Bassey being on the right-hand side that actually undid us that day but we actually had quite a few opportunities Spurs always will give you that now of course they will make opportunities at the other end it feels whenever you play Spurs a bit like a basketball game you could lose 4-0 but you could also win 2 or 3-0 everything's kind of on the cards when you play them it just slightly depends how it falls yeah, that game last season is still in my mind as one of those ones that got away really we had a lot of chances played quite well and uh, just defensively were you know gifted them some goals yeah. and you 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 can't do that i think the the promising thing for fulham this season is we've done a little less of that um we obviously gifted wolves a few goals in in one game um last weekend but i think we've got some uh some learning to do I, i'll take jack's point in respect of how you how you tweak a side and also how much of the ball you want to hold in a in a stadium like that um, I wonder if actually having the ball a bit more would start the mumbling and grumbling of those ever so um, even handed and generous uh, Tottenham season ticket holders you know they're always uh, very patient uh, with their team aren't they mm. um, and you just need to be in the game the, 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 they've got such lightning speed on transition as Jack has already outlined earlier today, but that with that comes an opportunity. They will throw numbers forward, and we do have patterns of play that that could work. So I think um, I think there are real signs of positivity, and I'm excited to see how we do. Yeah, because you know Silver has talked all this week, and in the immediate aftermath of uh, the sort of terrible result on, on Saturday about needing to bounce back, analysing the game and um, getting us on the front foot. And I'm intrigued to see how he sets us up. And also, you know, I'll take him by your point, Sammy. We're not going to... Um, we, we, we shouldn't be in absolute despair as to last Saturday's result. But it is also the barometer of how a team, you know, uh, progresses. What, you, you will always have those seismic results because it's the Premier League every team can can beat one another and there are a number of teams in false positions at the moment but we are the sort of side who can go somewhere like, like Spurs and win and that needs to be the target now yeah one million percent you know who we lost to the week before we won three nil against Spurs last time you can say Wolves Wolverhampton Wanderers <laughs> <laughs> ah. Yeah, I've got a really good feeling about this game. Obviously, that might come back to bite me, but I do think there's a sense of freedom going away to a top six side where ultimately, if we don't come away with anything, it will be disappointing, but we weren't expecting to. But I just think Spurs have a slight mentality block sometimes. I think we really saw it in their game at Brighton this year when they were two should have been 3-0 up going into the break and ended up losing it 3-2. And I think that they're a team that crumble quite easily. And I do think we could take advantage of that. Um, and then if we do lose at least we weren't ever expecting to get anything yeah million percent I, I think it's definitely like very possible I, say, I, I think it's going to be a really 
entertaining, exciting game. I, I feel like it's one of those that maybe Sky might have missed a trick not putting it on, on the TV because I think I think this will be, one way or another, uh, pretty entertaining. Um, let's um, quickly... Actually, I was going to go into emails, but any other kind of... We've obviously kind of widely talked about the midfield three and I assume loosely assumed that Adama would, would start. But are there any other major changes that that you would make if Adama does come in is that Nelson dropping out of the team for you for me yeah but um you've you've got to look at Harry Wilson as well you know at some point Harry Wilson's going to ask what more he could do you know he's handed a poison chalice last weekend come on and try and rescue a game as you've done done previously and as Jack says he can offer um uh depth in all three of those uh, attacking midfield or, or wide, wide positions, and I just feel there's something about there's something about playing in that number ten position for Wales that has really reinvigorated him. He's technically a wonderful footballer. You can't fault his work rate yeah. and effort, and he's one of the few players in the team who's willing to have a pop from twenty five yards. You know, Iwobi did it um, on Saturday to great effect, and and, and did it at Everton. But we are a bit predictable sometimes. Pass, 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 pass. Try and put it in the box. Oh, there are seven brick. I nearly swore on the podcast. Seven really tall <laughs> centre backs in the in the way, and oh, they're able to repel, repel the cross or yeah. clear it away on the ground. You know, you do need a bit of an X factor. You do need to be a little less predictable. And part of me is like Wilson deserves a start. Yeah. I don't think anyone can can uh, deny that it's just a question of how you get him in there his versatility actually might be a bit of a curse in this regard right in that if you have him on yeah but or bobby deck would overread to a point right like you know the fact that he can play either side or in the 10 means that he's an exceptionally useful substitute because if someone's not playing well or there are tired legs in there you can put harry in and look he did this at the weekend right he came on and he played wide and then in the second in the second part of that once the second switch has happened he was shifted into the middle and he started to have more of an effect so i i do think it's it's one of those tricky ones i would love to see harry wilson given a run in the 10 ahead of Berger and Lukic. Like, if, if it was up to me, I'd give him that go. I'd play Adama on one side, Iwobi on the other. And if it wasn't working, I'd shift Iwobi infield and switch Harry and, and, and Alex over so that they had that kind of ability. So I don't think Marco will go that drastic with his changes. But equally, if we are going to end up playing in a game that does require transition and does require us trying to get in behind... Well, Wilson's actually a lot faster than both Smithrow and Pereira. So there is that to consider as well. So I, I'm not 100% sure Silva would do that, but I do think it's worth considering. Yeah, I found it a bit peculiar as well on Saturday how you brought on Wilson and then you put him on the right and then a Wobi central. And a Wobi, like is great in the 10, but I think he'd, he'd had a long game by that point, was pretty tired. And I felt, like, felt like it nullified the impact of Wilson a little bit and... Yeah, particularly after Wilson did so well uh, coming on the last two in that 10 role. Um, he didn't always play 10 against Palace, but he did play a bit. Um, I was a bit surprised by that. Let's go on some emails. Um, the first one from Marty Morganello. Long time listener, first time emailer. Just listening to your latest pod and was psyched to hear about another Fulham fan in Charleston, South Carolina. By the way, I can't believe how badly you shafted me in this. I got so much grief for thinking it was Charlotte, like it's because you just absolutely butchered the pronunciation of it. Yeah, <laughs> I got probably um, as many messages about this as when I thought that Joachim Anderson was left footed. Um, he said, by the way, you pronounce the ch like chicken, not like Charlotte. Being a Fulham supporter since 2004 when Brian McBride joined the club and totally fell in love with Fulham from the start. Come on, you whites. And that's Marty Morganello from Charleston. Well, like, to be honest, if, you didn't, if we'd read it out, it would be fine. Like, have you never watched Strictly? <laughs> Charleston. It's a dance. Yeah. It's, I also, did... it's also a hugely important town in, in American history. Yeah, because and it created I, a dance. And I thought... It... <laughs> I thought a well-read man like yourself, a cultured man like yourself, Sammy, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't do that. Yeah, um, I, I, but there are quite a lot of uh, Fulham supporters in South Carolina, uh, as I discovered earlier this summer. So uh, that's excellent. Are we going to link up our two Charleston fans? 
We, we can do. We've got to do that. Send in, send in your emails. We'll switch them. We'll send I, had in this we, I had to do this the other week for a fan from Melbourne who was like, could you put me in touch with the other fan from Melbourne? I was like, all right, I'm running a, I'm running some sort of like Fulham dating service now. It's not... Mate, this is, this is what you've signed up for. I'm um, another Charleston fact, and uh, Liz will remember this from the quick take on Saturday. I got given a, uh, a bit, an American candy bar uh, from a colleague who had just been to America and it was called a Charleston Chew. And Did you eat it? Oh, it was beautiful. It was really delicious. Basically, a bar of nougat, but just then with oh, chocolate very on nice. top of it. We Is like that nougat. We, <laughs> we were both feeling quite battered French. by the rain. It's nougat, nougat. And then Sammy pulls out this massive bar of chocolate, and we're thinking that's the energy we need to get us through the quick take. It was Honestly, delightful. I don't think the quick take would have happened if it wasn't for the Charleston show. Yeah, we were it was. Door. It was quite bleak. Uh, let's go on to this next email from Paul Taylor. Uh, I just enjoyed this one. Not particularly a question, but. Uh, a landmark for for Paul uh, said hi Sammy and the Fulhamish team my brother John and I were taken by our uncle to our first football match 50 years ago in November 1974 we had not heard of either team but Fulham beat Villa and so since then we have been Fulham fans to celebrate 100 years between us of being Fulham fans we've invited friends and family to the match against Wolves uh, there will be at least 15 of us at the match with some more joining for a meal in the evening afterwards we have season tickets in the Johnny Haynes stand uh, we sit near Farrell Monk oh sorry about that, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> um, but we have opted for the comfier seats we hope in the Riverside for the game we will try to make some noise we're thoroughly enjoying the season adjusting to the team's excellence and unfulfilling moments such as the late goals against Brentford we are both big fans of the pod and fair, spend far too much time scrolling through uh, your telegram group each week we have dreams of submitting a song that breaks into the this will catch on top 10 keep up the great work thanks from paul a 100 year anniversary that's amazing that's uh, between them of, uh, of, of heading to fulham yeah. dare i say a very fulhamish that he goes to all this trouble and the, boy, <laughs> and the boys didn't turn up I, I, i'm yeah. certain that the meal was better than the uh, than the football but doesn't it rather sum up your fulham experience oh, i remember my my father i've told this story off the pod before but my father um sitting me down when I was like three or four years old and saying, do you really want to be a Fulham fan? Do you know how much heartbreak you're going to put yourself in for? Because this team has never won anything and at that time was never likely to. I mean, I did get an Intertoto Cup out of it, I guess. But um, a winner. he was absolutely insistent that on the flip side, this would be brilliant for me in terms of character building in my young life because nothing will disappoint you more than <laughs> Fulham come 5.30 <laughs> on a Saturday afternoon. But massive congratulations to the to the Taylors. Those kind of stories are, are commonplace amongst the, the, the fan base and it's one of the things that makes Craven Cottage and following our club so special because uh, the four of us perhaps probably wouldn't know each other um, if, we weren't, if we weren't Fulham fans. Um, and it's a special club um, um, and we all uh, look after uh, one another. Yeah, 100%. Uh, congratulations once again. Uh, back onto the football from Gerard Lyons, who says, Hi, Fulhamish. Was today, this was written on Saturday, a reality check on European ambitions, not just because of the result, but the truly dire performance. Regardless of us playing so, so well so far this season and having good squad depth, European ambitions require beating Wolves at home and not dropping points in the 94th minute against West Ham and Everton. Ahead of today, I was looking up after the next couple of games, we could easily be 12th, 13th. I fear without getting European football silver will be tempted to move on and best from gerard i think there's a couple of points in there jack mm. um first of all was the kind of like slight um getting ahead of ourselves after palace and i think we were all guilty a little bit of thinking wow what could this fulham team achieve this season i still don't believe that losing to wolves really makes too much of a dent but i i, I think that the only chance of europe and this was mentioned again on monday is maybe eight maybe yeah and hoping that it slips down i, I said this last week I, I i don't think it necessarily is a, a, a well it might be a reality check liz and i were talking about this last week and the kind of nature of the premier league with how few points there are between the sides sort of you know aside from the teams right at the bottom i think it, it's interesting because you're then at that point kind of going like well a couple of results left right and center and you can slip down to 13th 14th i think actually you know if things go badly over the next couple of weeks which is possible considering the run of fixtures we have that might be a little bit kind in terms of of where we are and where we might be 
that's also fine. Like, these are the things that you kind of have to, to deal with, to roll with. And there is this sense that Fulham need to be building year on year, right? Solidifying and finding a way to push on and through new boundaries. Now, we spoke about this before in terms of the first season was about solidifying ourselves, beating the teams around us and making sure we were safe. Last year was like, okay, we can be afford to be a little bit more erratic perhaps, but it mean, meant that we were able to give bloody noses to some of the big guns that win of Arsenal, that win at Spurs, as you know, already mentioned. This year, I think that there is a sense that this team is evolving once again. We're looking at it from a different perspective. We have, in the last two years, lost our two best and most important players, by my book, uh, in Alexander Mitrovic and Joao Polina. And it's about learning how to deal with those setbacks without that coming, you know, meaning your season comes crashing down and you end up in a relegation dogfight. Now, that's a good thing. To learn how to deal with that is something that every team in a position like ours or Brighton's, there are a couple of head, you know, years ahead of us, I think, in, in this kind of situation, is something you need to learn to deal with because once players come through and they start to shine for you, ultimately, there are bigger clubs in the food chain. It's just how it is. Yeah. So... Actually learning how to deal with that and not letting the world come crashing down on us when a big player or a big component of the team leaves has been a big step forward, I think, from that perspective. And I think the Silver understands that journey. Now, I do wonder if there are, at some point, there is someone that's going to come in for him, but it's a risk, right? And there are also those levels that whilst I and you and Dan and Liz and everyone listening to this understands that Marco Silva is a wonderful, wonderful manager, there is still that question mark about people jumping up from you know a, a team of, of Fulham Station or, or Brighton Station etc to a top six side and we've seen that time and time and time again that those sides have looked elsewhere generally outside of England to try and bring a player uh, bring a manager in when they move onwards and it happened again with Manchester United and Ruben Amorim instead of you know looking at Silva or Frank, Frank or yeah. you know Gary Neal, I don't know. It doesn't matter. But Could the you point, imagine? no. But the point, the, well, they spoke to Gary Neal in the summer. But like the, yeah. the kind of point, and didn't stands, speak to him again. Yeah, they didn't speak to him again this time around. No, you're right. Um, but the point stands that they tend to look elsewhere. So there will come a time where a manager, a managerial opportunity becomes available, and Marco Silva is under consideration for it. I don't really think it's going to be in England unless Tottenham decide they're going to part ways with Ange Postecoglou, which I can't really see. To be no. perfectly honest with you, like I, I don't see why any of the others or when any of the others would make a move for Marcus Silva. Now, jobs might come up elsewhere, a bigger job, a European job in, you know, La Liga or Serie A or, or wherever. But Marcus Silva has been quite candid with his desire to work in the Premier League. So it kind of means that there is this sort of element of I can't you can worry about Marco Silva moving on of course it's a perfectly reasonable thing to worry about because he's a wonderful manager and he you know rightly should be in demand from from other clubs because he's excellent but equally I don't really see where the slot is available for him to go into that would be a major jump up from where Fulham are especially in a project that he is fundamentally quite in control of at this point. Yeah, I mean, Dan, for me, in terms of Silver's future, and Jack alluded to it there, the only two clubs that worry me in terms of they could come and poach Marco is West Ham and Tottenham. They're the only two. And I do believe that I don't know if West Ham would tempt him, but that Tottenham would. Well, they're both tried. So, you know, we can, we can look at that already and say, you know, West Ham have tried twice attempt to Marco Silva and failed. And Spurs certainly spoke to Marco's agent before appointing Hans Postacoglu. And it's plausible that, uh, look, oh, let, let's just um, congratulate the rest of the Premier League on their stupidity um, yeah. for uh, leaving Marco Silva exactly where he is. And there's another element to this. He loves being the full manager, you know. Um, I've been in press conferences with him where you've heard him eulogise about Josh King or um, the how Craven Cottage particularly uh, still was really struck by how he compared the atmosphere the day we went up or rather the day we won the championship against Luton favourably with any other atmosphere he's coached under and that that was going to be the difference to keep Fulham in the Premier League. He recognises that, yes, he took a step down to, to come to Fulham, but he's taken several several steps forward. I was just on the point about Europe and, uh, and not Europe. 
Um, we do. It illustrates the fickle nature of football fans. After we beat Palace, you know, we're talking about Champions League and and all of these things. And because we've a certain Fulhamish podcaster did say we'd win the league. But yeah, that was quite something. <laughs> um, not guilty. Morning, Jack Kelly. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, he's probably recovering from a cold night at Marksborough Park, like me last night. Um, <laughs> but uh, look, I think we have unfinished business in the continental competitions. I think this silver side would do really well, but we shouldn't run before we can walk. You've got to demonstrate your capability. And I'm not willing to rule out the idea that we could qualify for Europe. Maybe not through the league, but it isn't about time we had a good crack at the FA Cup. You know, oh, I do love a cup. We right got now. close in the League Cup last season. Don't start off, don't On our day, <laughs> well, on our day, Sammy's, we're still, ma- Sammy's still mourning the Preston loss. Well, you so and me that, both. Thank I you, a up, sensible man coming I on here that cares up, uh, about the Carabao Cup. I wondered whether I would ever make it out of that stadium alive, given how long the uh, penalty <laughs> shootout was <laughs> going on. Um, but look, there's a serious point here. To even have Fulham in, to have us actively entertaining the idea of European football shows just how much of a genius Marco Silva is. And Jack hit on it right at the end of his contribution there. He's very much in control of this project. Yeah. No player comes in without Marco having ticked it in that famous two ticks system. And he's you watch the um, the videos that they put out, particularly after Brentford, uh, the, the full access videos, they're not fake. He, you know, he genuinely has fostered an atmosphere whereby it's an open discussion and they're all pulling for each other. And it's actually a wonderful time to be a Fulham fan yeah. in terms of our history. You know, this has the potential to be the best Fulham side we've ever seen. And, and on, on technical ability and watchable, um, watchable nature of football... Uh, I, I think it is. So was it Gerard who, who yes. sent us that email? Don't despair, Gerard. I really do think that we can, as Sammy said earlier on, and in the in the quick take, we can um, overinterpret results due to recency bias. Um, the test, of course, will be these next four or five games where we're playing a higher echelon of side, yeah. and we have to uh, match up with them. But for the first time in my long, you know, many many years of following Fulham to to the point of absolute despair. I'm not fearing any of these teams. I think we can cause them problems. Yeah, and there is something else that we're going to have to overcome if we're to, to get into Europe. And uh, Stan, in our next email, uh, indicates why. Hi, Fulhamish. Long-time listener, first-time email. Hello, Stan. We must beat Spurs this weekend to stop our away shirt curse. <laughs> It may have been mentioned before, but I'm pointing out my worrying realisation that we have not won in our away or third shirt in all competitions since going all the way back to St. Mary's in the 22-23 season, which was... What? Uh, I'm not having that. That's an unbelievable stat, if 13th, that's true. 13th of May, 23. It's worth mentioning that we have come close a few times, to name a few. Last season at Sheffield United away, the 3 all, Brentford away, the 0-0. And this season, Preston away, one all. Uh, this must be a record for Fulham. Um, if not, it must be soon. How long do you think we'll have to wait to break the curse? After Spurs, our next opportunities that I can look to will be Newcastle in February, Brighton in March, and then Southampton in April. It's worrying that I can see us having to wait until Southampton again, making it almost two full years. I hope this research is useful. I appreciate the good work you put in for the podcast. I'll see some of you at Spurs. Come on, you whites. Thanks from Stan. We didn't... <laughs> yeah, that's true, because we won we... four times away last season, oh, and every white, time we so... played in white. Yeah, we don't wear our away strip that often. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we play in white, Wheaton, so we're, we're hamstrung by the fact that, A, um... The, it's uh, other, to uh, see our players in the away. <laughs> no, no. I meant more that um, other cl- other cl- other clubs' kits don't clash don't, too don't much. allow us the opportunity to wear what have been some quite um, raunchy away strips in in, in recent in, in recent seasons. This away strip deserves a win. Which one are you talking about? The, the red, red and black. black. The red and black. This, right. Although I do like the all black. Yeah. Did the yeah. pink not deserve a win? Sorry? Nah. Oh, thank yeah. you. Oh, thank the you. Pink, the, pink, the pink was literally a fashion shirt. I was so into it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that shirt. So did I. I yeah. love that shirt. It was for catwalks. 
Well, it may be you got on some as a result. I well, did. Well but done, no, that's son. That's a separate but point. That is an absolute catwalk shirt. Mind blowing stat from Stan. And I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. He asked when we might have to wait, Sammy. And we've all been pretty confident about this weekend. Maybe we won't have to wait all that long. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. We were in black when we beat um, Spurs back in 2003, if I'm not mistaken. The Barry Hale show was Yes, almost... and we were in black again when we beat Spurs in 2012. The Berbatov goal. Yeah, the black with the, um, the golden white sash. Yes. Mm. Great, great kit. Um, yeah, so look, Stan, appreciate... Uh, great knowledge, Stan. That was incredible. That. Shirt there. Thank you very much. Final one. Um, we've kind of touched on this, but I don't think it's necessarily too bad going over old ground. Michael Burdett says, hi, Fulhamish team. I'm a relatively recent listener of the podcast. Thanks. Keep it coming. Uh, well, welcome along, Michael. Uh, reflecting on the Wolves game, I am surprised you all went so light on Pereira. I agree that there were a number of poor performances, including Reese Nelson and Anderson, but Pereira was a different level. He gave the ball away at least five or six times, which is unacceptable at this level. And what are other upsides to his game that I'm not seeing cannot compensate for this. He is the weak link in this team. Lukic, who played superbly in the first half, and Berger, who is growing in stature in this team, need to be given a go together, given this tough run of the games coming up. Separately, while Smith Rowe is highly talented, he is too predictable. He likes floating down the left-hand side and can cause real problems down that flank with Robinson on the overlap. It'd be great to see him contribute more on the right as well. We are becoming too predictable in all our strongest moments coming down the left, which is particularly the case when Triore isn't playing how many whites from mikey b um i mean as we say dan we have gone over this i feel like is michael burdett a burner for dan crawford no I, well well no first of all um <laughs> Doth, the one thing much. the one thing the one thing anyone can say for me to for me about good or real is i put my name to the nonsense <laughs> that comes out of my mouth or yeah. out of my brain it's just great minds um, just great minds um, thinking alike. what i would look I feel very conflicted with regards to Andreas Pereira because he was a pivotal part of the first two seasons of this side. Yeah. And I think he still can be. I think he's just being deployed and struggling in a deeper position. Agreed. I absolutely agree with what Michael said about his performance on Saturday. But if we go back before the international break, you've got a great demonstration of how Pereira and Smith Rowe can gel together in that system and work but one of silver's great tactical stand um tactical uh uh strategies if you like over his time of uh, being the Fulham manager he's, he's able to tinker and switch and give the lie to the idea that he's only got one way of playing I think Pereira's best in that number 10 role particularly because he can lead the press yep. in a way that nobody else can the problem is Pereira and Smith Rowe, as I said earlier, getting in each other's way in conventional midfield positions. And I was most angry about Andreas Pereira when he tracked Liam Delap all the way back at Portman Road and didn't put a scratch on him at all, as Pep Guardiola would say. Um, you know, I, uh, but I, you have to countenance that with the fact that he's a creative player. He is going to try passes. I remember people castigating Danny Murphy in that great escape season, that Murphy would give the ball away frequently because he'd try an ambitious pass yeah. or he'd try and get us going forward. Nobody has a bad word to say about Danny Murphy now. He's a bona fide Fulham legend, right? Um, and I think we just have to... I've never been a Fulham fan who gets on players' backs because it doesn't help. They're not trying to lose. They're not trying to pass the ball out of play. They're not running into a brick wall intentionally of old gold, as it seemed like on or on Saturday. That being said, it might be try, time to try something different, as we've all indicated um, for this weekend. Yeah. I, obviously, I wasn't um, on, on your previous podcast where you went really soft on Andreas Pereira, um, but I, I would want to acknowledge that um, he's played an important part for, for, for Fulham uh, over these past couple of seasons and he's got back in that Brazil side and that sort of says that he does have the ability and I would finish it simply by saying the goal we scored against Manchester City the opening goal at Manchester City would not have been possible without that 
dynamic understanding between Raul and Pereira, and we just need him to score more. Yeah. Right. Need, how you get that? Him in position. That's how the main you thing. get that out of him, and how you split those creative duties between Pereira and Smith Rowe. I think eventually you're going to have to choose one of them. All right. Well, we will leave the uh, the discussion there for today. Really. In- Sammy, don't you have? A, you can cut this if you want, but don't you have a question for Jack and Dan? Oh God. <laughs> no. Don't make me ask it. Do it. Go on. <laughs> I want to hear it, and you can cut it. Okay, I said earlier when we were having lunch. <laughs> no, I can't say. Do it, do it. <laughs> do you want me to ask? Go you? on, this. I, yeah. can, I can say. I can say. I can say. I hypothesised. So Anderson needed to come off. Mm. Him going down to ten men basically meant that Fulham had almost had zero chance of getting back into the game on Saturday. And obviously, there was medical advice that he could not continue. I hypothesised in that maybe if it was a more important match than it was, maybe let's say it was a cup semi-final or something like that, would you have been better off putting Joachim Anderson in goal and putting Bert Leno up front? (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, sometimes, Samuel. (laughs) Sometimes. (laughs) I think the idea (laughs) is... Anderson goes into goal, which is great if you've got a hamstring injury, because famously that makes you really Does agile. Does he still do the same? Jump. Does he get the gloves and the shirt? Yeah, yeah, gloves yeah. and shirt, obviously. He can line up the free kicks. And then <laughs> Bernd Leno goes up front, and we choose one of our players up front, or Sasha Lukic or someone. To someone like Sasha Lukic to drop into centre-back. Mm-hmm. Bernd Leno just, you know, big man up top, why not? Um, well, well, t- I mean, if, if, if Anderson isn't... Like fit enough to limp around at the back. How's he like, going to drive for the ball? Anything? Well, I mean, ultimately, <laughs> like he's just he's three just, of those he... goals. Two of those goals went right in the, the corner. corner. Yeah, <laughs> like... but those goals might not. Like Cooney wouldn't have enough time and space to have that shot if there is eleven men on the pitch. I sometimes wonder whether you spend a bit too much time thinking about this sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, I, I think maybe <laughs> like, you've overthought. I can't it believe no one's at least no. like reasoning with me well, that eleven uh, players uh, are better than ten. Well, I understand. But like you, basically the same argument saying we. We could just pick the bloke out of the front row and stack him up top. Would that be better? Well, based on some of the well, Bert Leno's a professional footballer. Sure. I mean, he's, he's a, a goalkeeper. He's a big man. He's a goalkeeper. <laughs> they're they're very different roles. I think the actual issue is that you're thinking that Anderson would be okay in goal when he's got a muscular injury that means he can't leap around. Honestly, I genuinely he's think that strain, my, right? my, 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 my response to this in like genuinely serious terms is that if Joachim Anderson is fit enough to be in goal, he would be fit enough to be the bloke that just stands around up top. And you just basically don't play the ball. You get him to stand in the penalty area. That was my area, other idea. And you don't, you don't play the ball to him unless you've literally driven up there and the defence have had to be back, right? It's just something for them to think about. It's astonishing that the FA didn't call you when they parted, when, when Gareth Southgate told them <laughs> that uh, his time was up, Sammy. You really, you know, you really, uh, you're ducking the key decisions. I'd, I'd love... I'm I'd, just thinking outside love, the box I'd here. I'd love to see you on the touchline. That's the sort of thing that Laurie Sanchez would come up with. <laughs> it's very Mike Bassett, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, I'm going to play in the Christmas pudding shape. <laughs> like, All I'm saying, if it's an FA Cup final and a similar situation... If it's an arise, FA Cup final, I guarantee you Anderson finds a way to force himself back onto the yeah, pitch. Yeah, th- this is what I think. If I think we've got no Not concern of him <laughs> overplaying a game that's maybe already lost... <laughs> He just like doses up on payment. Well, and also and he could have. For three. So, I think I got the idea because like great. you know whenever you play whenever you play five a side and someone picks up a knock, you often just sort of run it off, mate. No, often you just say, "We'll go and goal, mate." <laughs> right. <laughs> Like, at that, least... That's the logic that's taking there's a reason this why the bloke who picked up a knock wasn't in goal. I would to say begin the guy with. who plays in five is probably as I, good a striker as I could Mateus probably make a case for the fact that you think Leno's really good with his feet and therefore he could sweep up at the back in place of Joachim Anderson. But, yeah. I don't know. Oh, I do wonder whether I've stepped off the side of the universe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like I've gone through like, the court key. You know, I look. If anyone wants to uh, see me on Saturday and have this debate at the pub before or after Spurs, I'm happy to have it. Can you just tell people what pub you're going to be in so they can avoid you? <laughs> <laughs> well, and also, are you sure you're going to get the taxi to the, for the right number of people to the right place? Oh, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah, last year at Spurs Away, Jack booked a pub that was about five miles away from I went Spurs. to the Old Shillelagh in Stoke Newington, which is about 20 minutes in a cab from the ground, and it serves good pints of Guinness, and it's not packed with Spurs fans, which is ideal. 
Yeah, I must admit, I didn't realise there was six of us, and I did book the cab for five of us. So, that that yeah. was an oversight. Sammy left me <laughs> at the old chalet on anyone? my own. Yeah, he probably had a good evening, though, didn't yeah. he? I mean, I yeah. should have stayed. I should have stayed. But alas, here we are. Um, right, now I'll end the pod after completely embarrassing myself. Thank Sorry. you, Liz. Sorry. Um, thank you, Jack. Thank you, Sammy. Always a pleasure. <laughs> thank you, Dan. Absolutely sensational. Thank you, Sammy. And thank you, Liz. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we will be back George will be back uh, on Monday reviewing everything that happens at Tottenham and then myself and Jack no Thursday club next week because we play Brighton on Thursday so we'll be Friday clubbing it Friday club this is new yeah. I'm excited uh, next week which is exciting so we will return then come on you whites you whites you whites